Good day, Joe. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Hey, Guy, how are you? Welcome from sunny Galena, Illinois. <laughs> Uh, good to see you again. Uh, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself? And let's start off with, you know, where did you grow up, where you went to college, and what you studied? Sure. I My name is Joe Sainer, and uh, I grew up from the south side of Chicago, um, way south side, so nothing like you hear in the videos. Uh, went to, uh, you know, kind of the, the Catholic high school prep school route. Uh, went away to the University of Colorado, had uh, just this wonderful time, and and in two years got this nice letter from my draft board. It said, you know, 2S doesn't stand for ski. It's not what we had in mind. And so I ended up uh, enlisting in the Army uh, so I could make some of my own choices. Spent, spent three years in the Army and then uh, got out and went to uh, a private engineering school on the south side of Chicago called IIT. I did that for a couple of years and then recognized that the uh, student loan debts, even in, in 1976, were racking up. So I got a job in the engineering profession because after after that point, I had I literally had a lot of the real senior stuff done, things like you know, science materials. And had a minor in calculus and just you know just in mathematics. So I, I had a lot of the hard stuff done, and I got out and started. To, Work in the design field, actually designing in the nuclear power plant construction field. And literally went to school for the rest of my life. So that was that was like 1977. We got married about, so that's about the time I, I left IIT. And I finally finished my formal teaching at part of education in 2010. So that was, talk about lifelong learning. It's something I've always chosen to do it. I like learning new things. I've threatened to go get a master's in, in analytics at this point. I think I think Linda, Linda's going to kill me if I do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's jump ahead to today. So uh, what are you doing? Today? I am. I'm currently retired, retired in August. Uh, I reti retired out of the medical device industry. So when you're when I see all these things in the news about, you know, GM is going to go make, you know, respirators, my reaction is no, I don't think so. They may be really good at bringing other people together who can build respirators, and that they are good at. But so I, I spent the, about the last 19 years of my career as a senior executive in medical device manufacturing companies, large, 12 to 60 billion dollar manufacturing firms. So specialized in what's called design control, and I actually wrote my master's thesis in design control. So that's the the quality assurance side of how do you assure that the product you're designing does what you expect it to do and that the people working for you are competent to design it properly so that it will do what it's expected to do and not kind of most of the time but every single time with you know ex experiences and capability of, of greater than one in a million failure rate or you know less than one in a million failure rates so in, in medical devices and in aerospace, one in a million is a moderate risk of failure. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's fill in the gap then. So uh, getting out of the Army and going to school and then going to work as an engineer and today, can you share with us a little bit about your career progression? How, you know, tell us about the jobs and the companies and industries that you worked in to the point to where you got to the medical device? Sure, sure. So I... I uh, I moved into hydraulics and pneumatics. Uh, in the nuclear power plant world, you're dealing largely with with pressure vessels that are, you know, they may not, you know, a, a containment vessel for a nuclear power plant is is it got a design pressure of about 75 psi, which is not all that great, but it's 10 stories tall and it's 120 feet in diameter, so the forces are outrageous. So I went from there to hydraulic and pneumatic cylinders, and I was working in the design field, made my way up into into a director of engineering and quality role. Uh, I've never really been able to leave quality behind. I didn't choose to, but unlike a lot of industries in the nuclear power plant industry, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't allow you to segregate quality from design. They will they demand segregation of audit, but not of quality. It must be included in design. So that's always been. You know the the training that I had. I think it's probably the best foundation I had. So I went into. I, I ended up working for two separate companies, competitors, as a chief engineer and director of quality. 
um, director of engineering, director of quality. Um, like I said, going to school throughout my entire career, uh, actually got my professional engineering license before I had my degree, which, which is not what I would recommend for the faint of heart, but it's kind of the path that evolved in front of me. Um, if you're going to work in the nuclear industry, you're not going to approve any engineering drawings unless you're a PE. So for those who don't understand what that means, that's a, that's a 16 hours worth of an exam, two days long to cover two different levels of, of expertise. I took those tests back to back, but my, my youngest brother is a, is a PE, but he's, a, he's an attorney. <clears throat> and he tells people at parties that, He'll retake the bar exam twice before he ever takes the PE again. So, <laughs> so it's so I got to that point, and I literally, in my second stint at manufacturing, and you know, it got to the point where I got some really, really neat stuff, like you know, Harvard Business Review level article stuff at this fairly small, you know, two hundred million dollar manufacturing company. We did some great things. We had a great staff, and apparently, we we're going to have to sit down and cover it because. When you talk about rate of change, organizations have to be able to absorb and assimilate and get to a new state, what Duran calls the new level, or, or you, you're in a constant state of flux and you really don't know where you are and where, you know, from, what, from where to, to go to the next step. So that wasn't really intriguing to me, and I had a, had a, a lunch conversation with your partner at the time with Ray Fenson. And he said, you know, we can use somebody like you. And that's when I joined you and Ray and got into the consulting world for the first time. Um, did that for a few years and then I ended up going to Arthur Anderson. I was a partner with Arthur Anderson in the manufacturing excellence practice. Um, and, and literally like July of 2001, I uh, got offered an opportunity to join a major manufacturing company, about a $13 billion manufacturing company, to head up their internal quality award. I've been involved with the Malcolm Baldrige Award since the late 80s. And, and in fact, I'm still involved in a variant of it today. Uh, so that was, you know, that was my, my foray back into manufacturing. And within a year, I was heading up uh, design controls. I was heading up quality system deployment inside the design space for medical infusion pumps, IV pumps, apheresis machines, ventilators, those types of um, and did, that you. was back into it. So, uh -huh. so uh, can you share with us uh, any stories of, uh, of projects that were very interesting from, a, from an improvement standpoint? Yeah, one of the things that we, when I was with uh, I was with Baxter when I first got out of consulting, I went back to Baxter Healthcare. And one of my major customers, I actually worked for the corporate VP of quality, but one of my, my main customers was the uh, corporate VP of manufacturing. And this is an organization that had 132 manufacturing plants around the world. And so variability is your killer. Uh, and, and dealing with all the variability, if you're working in a, you know, 2 million square foot plant in, in, in uh, uh, Singapore versus a hundred thousand square foot plant on the south coast of Puerto Rico, so you know I he was always challenging to what's next, what's next, what's next, and we were always pushing for variability reduction and and literally we had gotten Six Sigma at that point when I'm talking about in 2004 Six Sigma to a to a very refined art and his rea he had read this article about this new technique called multivariate analysis. And he says, so how do we use multivariate? He says, that's really what's going on. We've got multiple things pulling at us from different directions. How do we manage the multivariate and how do we, how do, we do analysis at that level? Well, now you're not talking Excel spreadsheets anymore. Now you're, now you're, you're into some fairly heavy duty stuff. So, you know, Mike Gatling was the guy's name and he was always the challenge to pull us along. What's next? What's next? Uh, so that was very cool, um, and I got it. I tell people throughout my career, one of the most exciting projects I ever wrote down was with with you and Ray up on the you know North Slope of Alaska, working for the Alaska Pipeline Service Company. And when if somebody had told me when I was designing nuclear power plants, hey, listen, you're going to be designing training curriculum, I would have told them they were nuts, you know. 
but no, really, how do I how do I manage the world's longest manufacturing plant? It's 850 miles long. It's a thousand feet wide, and I can only work outdoors for about 90 days a year. So how do I do this, right? And how do I make sure that the that I can capture the the, the well-meaning intelligence from the experts who are working there to keep it going, right? So so that was just a suit. And as a mechanical engineer, that's like a kid in a candy store. This isn't supposed to work, guys. How do you do this? So it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those were yeah. the days. Well, th well, thank you for that. Uh, so let's segue into um, your first exposure to what some of us, me included, would call HPT, Human Performance Technology. It's also known by Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement or HPI, Human Performance Improvement. But you come at this from the quality side of the house, so to speak, so TDQM, Total Quality Management. But so this whole concept of performance improvement, can you share with us uh, your story of how you were exposed to this and uh, um, when, when that was in your career? So I think my first exposure was as chief engineer for these two companies. And they were competitive companies, but they were doing essentially the same thing. And my challenge was, you know, I, I was trying to get predictive about how long it would take to design a special application. So 40, almost 50% of the work that was coming out of those companies were custom special designs. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's custom or not, you know, you're gonna put 20,000 you know, PSI into a hydraulic pressure vessel, you better know what you're doing, right? And so I, I started to search around for techniques to reduce the variability in the design time. How long does it take this team to design the special? What's the, what's the delta between the earlier design and today? Because honestly, there's really very little things that are being designed new. And I've been telling engineers, and frankly, I would say I came at from the design engineer space. <clears throat> I've been telling engineers who work for me for my entire career, the day you've got to go solve a differential equation, stop, pick up the phone, and call me. If you haven't properly modeled this, we are not going to Mars. You know, let's think about this. And and in that effort, I ran into the work of guys like Philip Crosby and uh, W. Edward Stemming and Joseph Duran. And, and as a leader of the company that I was working with, how do I make that choice? How do I get my peers at the executive level to understand how important this is? and where the value is long-term, and then how do we choose which of these gurus to follow? And, you know, I, I took a group of executives to the Quality College and, you know, met Phil Crosby and did some work with, with the Crosby Institute, and that was interesting. That's good for cheerleading, but <clears throat> the Crosby plan doesn't give you any real tools to say, go do this next, or here's how I reduce variability. And so we looked at W. Edwards Deming, and, and Deming had the great philosophical approach to it, but in large measure what he serious what he did is seriously irritate executives. And so I wasn't going to be successful at doing that. So you know you're you're not you're, no red beat experiment. Yeah. No red beat yeah. experiment where you yell at the executives on stage. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean you've heard you've heard this rant from me before, right? And then and then somebody handed me Joe Duran's book and and I started to read Duran. And I will tell you, you know, I have professional certifications as quality engineer and Six Sigma Black Belt, I never took Phil Crosby's book into the test. I took Duran's books into the test because Duran will tell you, here's an example, here's how you reduce variability. And so we started to apply that at this manufacturing company in the south suburbs. And, and this was a company, it was about $200 million in revenue, but there were seven executives. And we met every morning and we talked about what are we going to do today? And, hey, did you see that this machine went down last night? And, hey, this load of tubing that came in from the supplier is really garbage. What are we going to, you know, that the day to day. And so, you know, we would talk about how are we going to get better? Because, of course, as executives, we believe that nobody else cared about the company when we went home at night except us. <clears throat> and which is, you know, if that's the case, then you're in serious trouble. You got to fix that first, right? And so we, were, we did some really neat things like self-managed work teams. And, you know, we, I, we built our own um, uh, electronic distribution of, uh, of uh, engineering drawings 
when those systems were costing three hundred thousand dollars, you know, I wrote my own one hundred fifty thousand lines of code. I wouldn't choose to do that again. But you know, so some really really great things, and and it was it was the toolkit that came with Jurian. So you asked a question about human performance technology. All that was about how do I teach things? How do I how do I get other people to see what to me? You know, this is kind of engineering speak. It's intuitively obvious. To the most casual observer, parenthetically, you idiot, why don't you get that? <laughs> well, that, you know, that trick never works, right? So, so I, we, we worked at how do we develop, to develop the experience around leading the change. It's not enough to know how to do it because you really never learn how to do it until you have to lead others to it. And it was in leaving that company to come to work with you where all that got pulled together where, okay, human performance technology really is a, is, a good, is a good label for a lot of different industries to come around to. No, it doesn't help to train somebody for the umpteenth time. They're not using it. They're not retaining it. The amount of retention that you get in a you know, PowerPoint lecture is less than 5%. What else are we going to do? So... It was, it was, you know, I think that experience and the experience of working with the professionals up on the pipeline were, allowed me to knit all this together to say, I think I've got something here. And, and in the background was the Baldrige model, the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, which today is still, I think, the best business model for any industry, whether it's a manufacturing company or an ad agency or a hospital or a school the model is essentially the same. It is ubiquitous, and that knits together what your shareholders or and what your what your stakeholders need from you. To how do I evolve the workforce to actually help me get it done, and then collect on the results and build metrics that are reflective of my efforts. You know, so uh, maybe that's a long way around it, but it's it's kind of gotten me to where I am. No, excellent. No, excellent. Thank you. So that's a great segue and an overlap of my next question, which is some of your biggest influences in all of this, people or articles or books. Now, you've mentioned Crosby, Deming, and Duran, you know, the big three of quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, there's more than that I, I appreciate. But uh, and, and the Baldridge Award. But um, so Duran's book you referenced. Now, I, I, I've owned those books in the past, but I, are there multiple? What's the title of the that book? particular book so we can point people to that so i i Do you remember there's there's four or five of them there's duran on quality there's the quality uh control handbook um you know these are the seminal works that i go to all day long there's uh, uh production inventory control which it really gets to how do i get predictive about my manufacturing processes um uh, there's Joran and Grina, Grina, Frank Grina, G-R-Y-N-A, was actually a professor at uh, Bradley University here in Illinois, and the two of them, you know, paired up to write some of these these books, and they were really about learning the tools and the statistics. So the trick is with with Joran and Joran and Grina, if you're if you're going to get serious about this and you cannot master even the fundamentals of statistics, move on, because when you get down to it, it's really kind of goofy. And, you know, at, at the age of 65, I would have senior engineers come into my office and say, what should the sampling plan look like for this particular design attribute? And it's like, you know, A, sampling plans do not work for design attributes. Sampling plans presume that you have a normal distribution of failure. You haven't designed it yet. So, but, you know, but, I, you know, I just, it felt like I was always teaching that and it, it you know, if you're going to get it, and I would suggest that's the guru that helped me. Um, beyond that, it was never be afraid to try. Because what we would do, and the company on the south side was called Bimba Manufacturing. They're still around. And, and my counterpart in manufacturing and I at breakfast, at coffee in the morning, I would walk in with a brand new Harvard Business Review article. Here, look at the... the the guys running the machining cell are hiring their own employees. Isn't that a cool idea? How would we make it work here? You know, and I don't know. Let's go give it a shot. Let's, you know, and and let's have that discussion with the VP of HR to say that we're not heathens, that we, we really think we can get this to work. And let's do away with annual performance reviews. And, you know, so, so 
don't be afraid to make that leap. And that was that was one of the learnings that, that, that we got at the at the Bimba site. You know, we can we can all get together. We can make a decision this morning and this afternoon. We changed directions. You know, we weren't encumbered by well, that isn't going to work here. So, mm-hmm. so uh, for new people kind of entering the field, who uh, maybe they're uh, in instructional design or some other aspect of HPT, such as process uh, and uh, and such, uh, are there? people, articles, or books that you might suggest for the person that's new to all of this as an entree to this world? Oh, gosh, guy, where do you begin, right? It's kind of like, where was the latest one you picked up, right? Because you keep learning. Um, I think the better the better coaching for, for folks in that field is stop thinking about HPT as the mechanism for success. Because it's not. It's part of the deal. It's part of the whole deal. And I fall back to the to the Baldrige model. There are seven criteria in the Baldrige model. And and they are numbered characteristically, one through seven, right? How creative can we get, right? And and category one is about leadership. And so do we read and do we start scoring the company by looking at leadership? I don't. I want to find out if all this is occurring because of or in spite of the leader, right? Where I begin is the organizational profile, they tell me who they are and what they are. That's the, that's the current state snapshot. Then, then comes strategy. How am I going to go from where I am to where I want to be? And how do I get there? I don't do that by going out and buying a bunch of new machine tools because they're fairly <laughs> inert, right? I have to go to actually it's category five. So category two, strategy Category three is um, is uh, customers and stakeholders. Category four is about your your systems, your internal IT systems. Category five is about performance management and people management. Have I properly segmented my workforce? Because you know, my workforce is not a homogeneous group. And how do I develop? You know, there's there's four things I can do with that workforce. I can hire, fire, train, and retire. And and taking the current workforce with the current knowledge, skills, attributes, and values and evolving them to those skills that I need for the future, that's how I change the company. I don't suddenly go into CNC machines, computer numerical controlled machines, which are now fairly stated, it's fairly regular stuff. I don't go into CNC until I've trained some people to figure out how to run them. So human performance technology becomes a phenomenal tool to evolve the strategy from current state to next stage state. And, and so now I've, now I've covered two, three, four, and five. Six is the processes. They're the major processes. How do I make my product? They're the minor processes. How do I design my strategy? Do I have a model, a, a, a systematic approach to do all that? And when I'm all done, seven is, here's the results. Here's what I said I was going to measure. Here's what I have been measuring. Here's the measures. That, by the way, most companies measure what they can, not what they should. And I, I know I learned that from you somewhere along the way, right? It's like, <clears throat> think about what you should be measuring. And your measures should be responsive to your efforts and indicative of the change. If if you run the same test time after time and you pass it every time, stop. Stop. That's that's not effective. It's not a differentiator. So you go through the results and then I go back to leadership. So my advice is take a look at that and you can get, you know, a PDF copy of this at the Baldrige Award um, on, online. Understand the model. If you want to learn more about the model, they can come back through you to get to me or the, I think you can put my LinkedIn site up. Do that. And there's all kinds of other, Mark Brown, who I worked for, or worked with, and and he's written a couple good books. on Mark Blazy, I think, is the, the the seminal work, and he does a new one every year on how does this model interact. So become the vehicle, human performance technology, the company rides on the people. Become the model, become the, the vehicle by which you can look at, at the head of manufacturing and say, I know that's what you're trying to do, but you know we don't have anybody who has those skills. And and how can I help you develop those skills in the workforce? That's I think the great opportunity for HPT. 
Yes, excellent. Thank you. So let's <clears throat> let's go back a little bit more about the Baldrige Award. Um, the Baldrige Award award used to be a pretty big deal back in the uh, late eighties and through the nineties, I think. And I'm not sure, you know, when it fell off the cliff and when the government stopped funding this, and you know who kind of owns it now. But but as somebody who's been involved in this since uh, pretty close near the beginning yeah. of it. Can you give us a, a short history of the Baldrige and what it is and what's its intent and, and kind of where it is today? Sure, sure. Uh, so it started in the late 80s, 88, mm -hmm. and uh, and I actually got involved in it because I was a new senior member of the American Society for Quality. And I think what ASQ did is they took the entire list of the new seniors and they sent it to the award office examiners, right? These are performance improvement proposals in theory. Let's see if we can marry this up. And ASQ has always been a part of the, the implementation of that award. And it was interesting in its formation. They tried to get guys like Deming and Duran and, and um, Crosby and, and Feigenbaum. And they got them all in a room and they didn't succeed in killing each other. And in the end, they, they, they came out with several variants and the current model has actually been in, in play since very early on. Uh, it was a lot more popular then because you had companies like Cadillac and and other companies winning the award. And and unfortunately, what happened at some point is people got into the business of winning the award. And we actually had that at Baxter. And and, and, I, and I, the first year I was at Baxter, we didn't nobody won. But you can imagine that didn't go over well. When I went down, I went to my boss and he said, we better go talk to Mike because he's not going to be happy. And Mike was throwing things around his office because we were going to throw this party, but nobody was going to come. And and my reaction is, if we want to give away trophies, we, it's a lot cheaper ways to do this. I mean, I was training 170 examiners that we would fly to Deerfield, Illinois in February for this boondoggle to Chicago in February to train them, and plus <laughs> all the other overhead and it. That's not it, you know. The guy, uh, early on, it's got to be 92, 93, I was at an award ceremony, uh, which is like going to a professional pep rally. You see all the companies that are going to be re recognized, and there were limits. There were five groups being examined. You couldn't have more than two winners in each group. And so the chairman of the foundation at that time was a guy named Jamie Houghton, who has since passed away, but Jamie Houghton was the chairman of the board of Corning Glass. They're the guys who make the Steuben crystal, out of which comes the actual trophy. And he got up to speak, and, you know, it's got, like, I think it was Bill Clinton sitting on stage, and, you know, this is a big deal. I mean, you're, you're, you're sc scanned by the you know, Secret Service to get into this room. So Jamie Howden comes up on stage, and he says, you know, listen, if you're looking for a trophy, I'll sell you a trophy for ten grand. It's way cheaper than what you're going to go through. <clears throat> where it's evolved to today, and I've, I've been privileged to work, I, I was chairman of the panel of judges in the state of Illinois for 11 years, and so I've, I've watched this evolution. I was also on the panel of judges for the Army, uh, Department of the Army Community of Excellence Award, where the Department of the Army, the Installation Management Command, was using this to review the installations around the world. So Yangsan Army Compound and Shape Headquarters, and the actual places where people lived and worked and had to deliver support services for combatants and uh, and to see how all how ubiquitous this model is. Uh, right now, where it's really, really in great play is in education and in healthcare. And I got to tell you, there's there wasn't a dry eye in the place when Sister Jean got up to <laughs> to give her acceptance speech for a hospital in Central Missouri. It tells the story about how three nuns went to Missouri in the middle of uh, a, a smallpox epidemic with a total of eighteen dollars between them and started a hospital. And you know, so really, some good, still some good learning. Whether or not you want to go for the trophy, I have never, in all of my years, ever suggested that one of my clients or one of my employers go for the award. Stop doing that. Let's figure out how to use the model to get better, let somebody else go for the award. Let someone else get distracted by that. We're gonna focus on what it means to be a better company. So it's still around and I'm currently working with a group called ACA, the AHCA is the American Healthcare Association. They specialize in long-term care facilities uh, and, and nursing homes. 
and they actually require that every one of their their companies, their members, has to participate. If you don't, we're going to give you your money back. You're not going to be a member. Uh, and you have to apply every three years, and you have to be, have a progression of application. Uh, and it's interesting because I, I think you and I were, you, you, you rescued me from a review one day when I was sitting in the co- hotel trying to read a, a, an application for a supplier to Motorola. And why were they applying for the award? Because God knows it wasn't because they knew what they were doing. Well, they were doing it because Motorola said, thou shalt do this. Because mm-hmm. Motorola had won. And it, by four, before Motorola was over, two of their divisions actually won. But that's the wrong reason, right? It's, it's stop doing that. You know, I, so you still see some of that. And I've got a, a team, we just finished an application. And it's like, this may have been frustrating to you, but think of the feedback we can give to that company. It's really tough to write feedback for world-class companies. Is what differentiator are you going to give them to say, here's how you're going to be better? You know, I, I just spent weeks reviewing you and there's nothing I can tell you, right? But for those who haven't figured out that results really means I ought to know what I'm asking and I ought to be able to show why it's important, I can give a whole lot better feedback to those companies starting out and make a real difference. So it's, it's, it's challenging and rewarding from that point of view. Now, the Baldrige, is it still operating at the state level? Um, it is. Some states. More so than at the national yeah, level? Yeah, so the national level manages the award mm-hmm. office, and, and there are still people who apply at the national level. But the real, the real takeover of this and the effective deployment of this has shown up at the, at the, uh, at the state level. And there's several states that are doing just a phenomenal job. Uh, Illinois is, is still doing a really good job at it. Minnesota has got one of the best in the, in the, in the business. Florida is quite good. Colorado is quite good. So, you know, those, they're, they're still really good applicants who are going through that. And just imagine working through your own local school district and understand some of the strife that goes on in the local school district. And say, hey, listen, how about if we tell you a way or, or together learn a way to be able to be predictive about our outcomes? You know, and <clears throat> pardon me, that's uh, at, at least, you know, this local school district here, I vowed to not do that here because you know, it's just a huge sucking sound. My wife would never <laughs> see me again, so. <clears throat> well, thank you for that. If, uh, let's uh, switch gears here a little bit as a way of providing an example to others if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? So this kind of switch gears to my my consultancy I'm working on right now. Right. It's, um, you know, it's kind of you get you get to the point where you want to retire and you want to get out of the daily rat race, but you don't quite want to get out of it, you know. I, and so what, uh, what literally what I've been doing since 2005-ish is the same thing. And I ended up writing my master's thesis on operational performance metrics of design control systems. How do you how do you design a product and know that it's going to work at the level that you want it to work forever? Right. So, you know, and I, I mentioned that in, in aerospace and in and in manufacturing quality medical devices, uh, one in a million isn't good enough. Uh, and an improbable event or, or a, yeah, so there are three different levels of events. There's, there's major, minor, and improbable in aerospace. An improbable event will occur less than one in a billion times, 10 to the minus ninth. And so what I'm helping companies do is understand in the medical device space, you really have to stop designing this like a business. You have to design it like, and if you get an email from me, you see the tagline, the number one canon of the code of ethics for professional engineers is to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the pro- of the public. And so I work with companies that say, how do you design a product? And yeah, you want to keep the FDA away from your door, right? You don't want the FDA to show up because 35% of them carry badges and guns. They really have no sense of humor that they're aware of. They don't want to be called stakeholders. They represent the public health. And all that's true. I don't mean to be facetious. They have an uncannily difficult job to do. But you don't want to you don't want to focus on operational excellence 
so that you don't get audited. You know, that's all that means is you're going to fail 50% of the time because the bar is pretty damn low, right? If I design the product properly, if I manage the organization properly, if I equip the workforce properly, compliance takes care of itself, really. So, so actually, right now, I'm in the middle, middle of writing a, a paper on, you know, why is a Boeing 737 MAX like an infusion pump? Well, why is it like a medical device? Because the things that went wrong in the design of the 737 MAX now are evident in retrospect. Uh, and they're the same things that we deal with all day long. What's You've got to design the product for the entire environment for use, including foreseeable misuse. How competent is the workforce using this device? What are the workflows I design into its operation and its software? You know, it doesn't matter whether you're, a, you know, a trauma nurse trying to hook up an infusion pump or you're the co-pilot trying to tell the pilot he's screwing up. You know, it's the human factors issues are the same. And so helping people understand that, you know, these rules really aren't that tough, but they are pretty important rules. And if we just forget about, I don't want the FDA to show up at my door, we got to the point in the, in the businesses that I was working in it got to the point of, come on, bring it on. We haven't seen you lately. Come on in. We'll show you what's going on. You know, <laughs> and, you know. At some point, they, you know, after two days, they go, okay, enough. I give up, and they get up and they leave. You know, that's where you want to be. You want to be, want to know so much about what you're doing that it's it's just so clear that you have control that you you are designing and executing properly on the product. <laughs> Pardon me. Thank you. So as a lifelong learner, and we, you, you shared a little bit with us about that, and you just talked about uh, what you're working on, this paper you're working on, but what's, what's your current or next focus for learning? Um, can you share with us uh, what you're pursuing and how you're going about that? So that's, I told you about that one paper. The other paper I'm, I'm, I'm helping, I'm going to write my part of it and someone else is going to write part of it. I, I'm on the uh, editorial board of a new publication that's being put out. To, to link operational performance excellence to the Baldrige model and to actually do it in a, in a, in a periodical that is peer-reviewed. And so the, the next paper we're writing is operational excellence versus compliance. And, you know, we have so many, I mean, honestly, the vast majority of manufacturing companies, medical device manufacturing companies, design their quality systems to be in compliance. And like I said, that's just, can we please set the bar just a little bit higher than that? And <clears throat> just a statistic about, about um, probability of occurrence for defect. The company I worked for had 350,000 infusion pumps in the field. And so you go into the hospital, they don't just hang an IV and let it drip into your arm. It's being pumped in, and it's being pumped by one of three companies. So we had 350,000 units in the field of one one brand anyway. And and so we determined that every one of those pumps on average was going to deliver three infusions a day. So a one in a million likelihood of failure, catastrophic failure, means that I'm going to kill someone or have to have someone directly intervene to make sure I don't kill someone every day. And is that what you want your product to do? And so now what we're really trying to do is to get, and the, the FDA has been hot on this too, and is having difficulty getting traction because the companies have so much invested in their current methodology of compliance. <clears throat> and so trying to get that and learn how to communicate that to companies to say, let's, can we please put the compliance bar away? Forget about that. Eh, don't really forget about it because federal law says you got to meet that. But if we do things right, that happens on its own. That comes not quite for free. So I'm trying to, you know, I understand that I believe that passionately. What am I working on is to try and figure out how to convey that and, and get other people to share in that, that vision. So. Thank you. The next question I have has to do with language, labels. 
uh, our nomenclature. Um, my question is, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Now, I normally set this up by saying, perhaps you feel that it needs to be clarified because people are misusing it, it's being misconstrued or something, and you would like to put your own spin on it. But uh, what term or phrase do you have? So I, so I think I, I would let, reach out for training as a technique because okay. I think a lot of organizations believe the training is the end. The training is what I've got to do in order to properly deliver product or service or, or whatever. And, and it's an important part of what we do, but, but it's so much more than that. It's not about, it, it, honestly, you, when, when you, when you make a mistake in the, in the medical device field, the FDA writes you this little form and it's called an FDA form for 483. So 482, they show up the door and it has the power of a federal subpoena. We're coming in. <clears throat> 483 says, here's where you did wrong, right? Invariably, if you look at the responses to the 483, it'll, it'll say, well, we're going to retrain the workforce. And why do I believe that that will be any more effective than it was the last time? I've reviewed your training system. You showed me the techniques that you use. <clears throat> and, oh, by the way, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have to take a test at the end of the training. Really, and what does that demonstrate? Because you can't use it for anything. You and I both understand that there's probably not a test of face validity that will stand up in a courtroom, so I can't fire the employee if they fail the test. Let's understand <clears throat> what what we really need. We got to the point at Baxter where we did do a test after all the training, and the test went to the trainers and said, here's what you delivered on, here's what you did not deliver on. What are we going to do to modify the training to improve that? And when we started to show that to our ISO auditors and to the to the FDA, the light went on. The reaction is, oh, so you're actually modifying your training system for enhanced delivery to try and further reduce defects. What a novel thought, you know. It's not a PowerPoint slide deck. It's not a lecture. It's none of those. It's not even on-the-job training, although that's better. It's about... What am I doing to constantly examine that system and effectively deploy changes in that system based on what I find? So training is so much more than what most organizations do. It's a gimme. Take me into a company, a, a client who wants to know how do we get better, and I'll, I'm going to spend two hours on what they're doing wrong in their training system. Because great, so you've proven everybody's gotten trained. What you've got, actually proven to me is that as a management team, you're incompetent to lead the workforce because you keep doing the same thing over and over again. So, you know, it's part of the rant, but that's, that's one that I would do. I think that's a necessary rant, but th and thank you for that. Um, the next question here is, I'm, I'm looking for some stories of uh, people that, uh, Maybe the audience knows the name or they don't know the name, but uh, I'm looking to humanize some people, whether it's a funny story, a serious story, but uh, people have had an influence in uh, your career. Um, and it's, it's another way of pointing our audience to resources, human beings, and, and uh, maybe what you've learned from them. But uh, uh, what can you share with us? Well, you know, I... <clears throat> Like a lot of people who come into the Baldrige model, you're generally an expert in your field before you get there. <clears throat> and the biggest challenge you have when you get there is that, guess what, so is everybody else. A little humility will, will go a long ways. And, and the, 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 the guy that I really learned a lot from was a guy named Mark Blasey. So uh, Mark um, has been at this for a long, long time, but he worked for, in the Department of Commerce for a long time, and he, he's now got his own and has had quantum performance group for 30 years, but <clears throat> what I what I learned from Mark was, you get first off, let's start by giving people the benefit of the doubt. You know, and Duran said this too, people don't come to work in the morning, Deming was famous for this, they don't come into work in the morning to say, I'm going to screw up. <clears throat> They're doing the best they can within the system that we have created for them. <clears throat> let's give them the benefit of the doubt and let's build systems that allow them to evolve and to learn and and to, to get better you teach people how to self-improve you build systems where they can't help but improve 
<clears throat> and like I said, I came into this. Well, it's it's clear to me that I, I know how to do this, you know. And and I think Marcus spent 30, 30 years teaching me I was wrong and teaching me, you know, there's there's way more to this. And so now I find myself on on conference calls with examiners who are like, what's wrong with this applicant? Don't they get this? And it's like, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. <clears throat> You may believe a SWOT analysis isn't the right tool to use for this, but that's how they say they do it. If it's not effective, we'll figure that out when we go look at process controls. We'll look at results. We'll we'll find it other places and look at the opportunity we have to go back to that applicant and say, here's how you're using SWOT analysis. That seems like a pretty unique application, but here's things that you haven't done and, and learn the Learn the thread. Learn the thread through the business model. Uh, and I think that's that's one of the big learnings I've gotten and from Mark, and I continue to get from him to this day. And we've been together and worked so often that now he just gives me, a, you know, kind of a screwy side eye look. You know what I'm going to say, you know. So. <laughs> Is there anybody else at that that you could share well, with Well, you know, I, I said I had gotten to know Duran and, and Crosby. Uh, and I, I the last time I saw Philip Crosby was at an ASQ conference like the year before he passed away. Um, the last time I saw Joe Duran, just a, a silly story, we were, at, we were at the Baldridge Awards, right? This, this is people in Washington, D.C. have, a, have a, an art and how do they eat on the public dole. <clears throat> so we've been at the award ceremony, and it's you know it's hosted by the Secretary of Commerce. The party last night was hosted by the Vice President, and the President is an invited guest. And so this is really high end. And we're walking from the uh, um, Mellon Auditorium at the Commerce Department, which is all inlaid marble, and we're walking from there to the the grand foyer at the Commerce Department, which is like. On the map, it looks like it's around the corner, but like everything in D.C., it's a good block away. And it's early May, and everything's in bloom, and we're kind of, as a crowd, moving down the center. Here comes this little guy with a Basque beret and a black trench coat. He's walking at least twice as fast as we are. He goes booking past. And I hollered after him. I said, Dr. Duran, you need to slow down. Mind you, at this point, he's like 95, right, because he lived to 103. And those aren't facetious numbers. He really did. <clears throat> he shouts over his shoulder without missing a step. He says, I don't have enough time left to slow down. And so those are things that you, you I think that taught me to be very respectful of the time that I've got. If you're, if you're an employee, the time has better be well placed when you're sitting with the GM because their attention span is roughly that of an ant. Right, they're they're being pulled in so many different directions. If you're a consultant, it's worse because they believe that you're paying. They're paying you to get the right answers, and why haven't you done that yet? So you have to be. I think I learned from that the respect for time. You don't have much. True. Thank you, Joe. As a part of a wrap up here, first of all, thanks for agreeing to do this interview with me. But for our audience and especially the new people in the audience, the people are just entering into this world, regardless of which angle they're coming into improvement from, what's your guidance for somebody that's new? Whether they're young, middle-aged, or older, you know, what, what, what can you share with them uh, to help them uh, as they begin to climb the learning curve? So one of the, one of the guys that you and I <clears throat> worked with was a guy named Herth Ostvogel. And Hert had a, a, just a, a very poignant phrase that you need to be present. No matter what you're doing, and it has to do with work, but it also has to do with our, with our private lives. You have to be present in the moment. If you, yeah, yeah we, we set a degree field up, and I wanted to design things, and I'm not sure I knew that, except my father knew that when I was five, right? Um, so I... You, you, you set up a career field and a, and a, a training or an education curriculum and your major and all that, that's great. But once you get out on the street and you start to actually do things, don't be afraid to grab for the brass ring. You have to be present. I'm not doing things today that I ever thought I would be doing in 1976. 
and I try to teach my children that along the way. My daughter is a is a, a teacher, and she's not teaching things today that she thought she'd be teaching in school. My son is a is a videographer. He started out going for a history teaching degree. It, he you know he decided that he didn't want to do that. So okay, change, adjust. Stop doing things that you don't want to do. Start doing things that you do want to do. I started out wanting to design product because it was very fulfilling. But then it got frustrating. Why can't others do things better? And so I went into engineering management, and, and that evolution, keep, the path keeps changing, and it keeps changing direction. There is no straight path from the degree I envisioned in 1976 to where I am today. It's, it doesn't happen. And so I spend a lot of time I'm on, the, on the faculty adjunct and on the uh, and vice president of the Alumni Society for Northern Illinois University. <clears throat> and what I try to convey to students, I teach engineering ethics classes. And they're like, well, we're never going to have to worry about that. And it's like, really? Let's think about this. Let's think about this. And what are you going to tell your boss when he wants you to do this and they have it done by tomorrow and you know there's no way in hell you can do that? You know, it's the path evolves, the path changes. Be present to recognize the opportunity and don't be afraid to say, well, I'll go try that. So, Very good. Thank you. Joe, thanks so much for doing this uh, interview with me and for sharing your wisdom and insights. You have a great day. Thanks very much, Guy. I had a, had a great time talking. I'll try and go have a cup of coffee and soothe my throat now. Thanks very much. <laughs> All right. All right. Cheers.